Hi, I'm Denise Willingboer, president of the National Watercolor Society. On behalf of the board of directors, I'm excited to welcome you to the NWS, the first 100 years with the Hilbert Museum of California Art, which spans a century of the National Watercolor Society's artists and artwork. Beginning in 1920, the pioneering California Watercolor Society artists expressed themselves artistically in exciting and innovative ways that have influenced us for a century. Though the name has changed to the National Watercolor Society, the same innovative spirit remains. This exhibition is exceptional with its combination of unique juried NWS members' paintings alongside curated works by early California Watercolor Society painters from the Hilbert Museum of California Art, which both exude timeless artistic invention. It offers an intimate glimpse of life through the eyes of the artist, which is fascinating. It is my great pleasure to introduce NWS past president, juror and curator, Ken Goldman, and Mark Hilbert, founder of the Hilbert Museum of California Art. Hi, Mark. It's nice to meet you. And hi, Ken. Nice to meet you, Denise. Thanks for joining us, both of you. I have a few questions I'd like to ask you that uh, I think everybody listening would uh, love to hear. The first question I was curious about was how this collaborative exhibition of 100 years began. So how did you and Ken, you and Mark um, come up with this concept? Well, it started in uh, 2015 when I became president. We were looking for away five years ahead of schedule uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary, which we knew we were coming up on. And uh, all of us on the board, we began to talk about ideas. And one of them was that it would be great if we could have a museum to show in. And throughout uh, my three years, I began to contact some of the museums. I have some pretty decent connections. and. Specifically, I ended up picking uh, Mark Hilbert's museum. Thanks, Ken. And Mark, did you want to add anything? Our museum to participate in the 100th anniversary was a real honor for us. Uh, as you know, we have uh, focused a lot of our uh, collecting in shows on watercolors. And so we, we felt very, uh, very excited to have this opportunity. Well, we are very honored to have this collaboration with you too, Mark. Thank you, thank you. Um, Mark, I understand you and your wife, Janet, are avid collectors of art and particularly of the California, early California watercolor paintings. Um, and we have some of those wonderful works in this exhibition. How did you begin collecting those extraordinary paintings? Well, thank you. Um, my wife and I found a little house in Palm Springs about uh, close to 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, we closed escrow and of course our bank account was empty. So we decided to go to a consignment shop and see uh, uh, if we could buy some furniture and paintings and so forth. Uh, and this particular consignment shop was run by a man that had a watercolor gallery. And he had a whole whole wall of California scene watercolors. And uh, I looked at these and I, I bought one. It was a landscape. I took it home and, you know, I kept looking at the opaqueness of the way it was created. Uh, and, and there was something, some quality about watercolor that that struck me that I really liked. And uh, so I went back there the, the following weekend and he introduced me to a book that was written by 
man by the name of Gordon McClelland, who is an early champion of the California scene paintings. And uh, so I looked through the book and I saw all these, these, these paintings of everyday life in California, which having grown up here in California, I could relate to. And uh, I, I, you know, it just was like the light bulb went on and I decided that, uh, that I really, and my wife as well, that we'd li really like to collect watercolors. Uh, but then uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing. A little later on, I, I brought home a, a, a beautiful landscape, which, which was the first thing that I started to buy was landscapes. And my wife encouraged me. She says, you know, uh, you ought to buy some paintings with people in them because it, to me, it's a little bit more interesting with people. Uh, although I like the landscapes too, but it's nice to have people in them as it does tell a story. And uh, so we tended to buy uh, a more, more figurative work over the years. And, um, but having said that, uh, March 6th, we're gonna open up a, a beautiful landscape show. So I'm, I'm very excited about that too. Well, thanks, Mark. That's really interesting that that small beginning grew into something so big like that. So very fascinating just just by going to a consignment shop. So I probably have over 3000 uh, paintings in our collection. Wow, that's amazing. And what did you begin with? How many paintings did you buy in the beginning? Just one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Ken, I wondered if you could give us some insights into the journeying process that you went through with uh, Jerry Bromer and the curatorial process that you went through for the whole exhibition. Well, the curatorial process was difficult because there are, like Mark said, there are so many really fine paintings in his collection. It was hard to know which ones I would end up using because uh, Jerry and I had not yet selected the artists who were going to be in the exhibition. Now, if we had been able to stay live and show in, at the actual museum, it wouldn't have been too much of a problem because there was going to be one room for the early California watercolor painters and then another large room for all the uh, National Watercolor Society members that were juried in. So uh, that wouldn't have been an issue, but since we went virtual, I had to uh, look at all these paintings and figure out how are they gonna go with the paintings that are juried in. So the way we juried it was we each had our turn. I um, took my first turn and looked at all the paintings and you know, we had, hundreds and hundreds of, of entries and we could only accept 81 members. We did our best um, and fortunately, we came to a pretty good consensus right away as to which ones he selected and which ones I selected and we were able to agree. There were probably about enough really fine paintings that we had to let go that we could have had another exhibition just as large as maybe two more exhibitions with paintings that were almost as good as the ones we selected. We, we did feel we got the best ones, but it was really difficult to let some of the second notch paintings go. Anyway, uh, that was pretty much how we went about it. And then once we had a selection, I was able to look at as a curator, I was able to look at all the paintings I had collected and set them next to the ones that were accepted, the ones I had collected from the Hilbert Museum and set them next to the ones that were accepted for the uh, uh, National Watercolor Society members. And what I had to do was put them all together and see which of the master paintings fit in best with the paintings that were going to be shown by the members. And it was all alphabetical. so. It was kind of a matter of just deciding aesthetically because they were all so good. It could have been almost anything. The one thing that was distinctive, for the most part, I was able to get uh, painters from the early California school who had 
been either presidents or all except one, they were members of the water, uh, the California Watercolor Society, which was the original version of the National Watercolor Society. So that's how it worked out. Oh, that's really interesting. So how long was the process, Ken? About a month of pulling things together because the first thing I did was to go through the Hilbert collection and I looked at every single painting he had and then had Mary Platt uh, and Emily Valdez condense it down into members of the California Watercolor Society. That helped a lot. Maybe Mark can could jump in and tell me how many pieces that is. Whatever it was, it was a lot. And uh, then uh, when it finally came time to jury, because there was a deadline for the entrance to jury and it was 10 days that I had to look at their work. And then I had a couple of days to go over it with, with Jerry before we made our final selections. Thanks, Ken. Do you, do you know how many pieces you submitted, Mark, to Ken? Well, I would, I would guess out of the 3,000, uh, probably 2,000 are watercolors. Yeah. Yeah, there was, wow. there was a lot. That's a big <laughs> challenge. You're, I, you go cross-eyed after a while. <laughs> and, and it really, it came down to, uh, there were some artists that like uh, um, Robert Woods and that, that were more, they were later or uh, it was just, it was hard to decide who I was going to put in at the end. And it ended up becoming an aesthetic uh, choice eventually. What was your reaction when you saw the whole show together? Well, I was I was stunned at how good it looked. And I had also seen the International Open that had come out, and that was a phenomenal show, which is still up to be viewed. And I looked at that, and I thought to myself, how can we compete with that? Well, I think we did. You know, I think that between all the members of the National Watercolor Society and all the great entries we got, we did really well. And uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to take all of the entries, um, but it, it was just uh, a, a phenomenal turnout. And, and I really liked the way it turned out. I'm, I'm very happy with it. And I, I'm very happy with the way Stephanie put it all together in the video that everybody will get to see. Thanks, Ken. And it is. It is really, um, I just was very impressed by the by all the artwork. So, and uh, really enjoyed seeing it all. And Mark, what did you think when the first time you saw the show together? It's an exquisite show. There's no, no doubt about it. It really is wonderful. And, and I get it. You know, I have high regard for uh, Ken's eye. Uh, he's, he's one of the best watercolorists uh, uh, currently going today and i thought well uh it would be really interesting to see which ones out of our collection that he, he picked out and there's always surprises oh he picked this one out how about that i wasn't sure if if anybody would like this one but i i liked it and bought it and sure enough uh, there it was uh so there was a number of those kind of uh surprises you might say and uh, and again, I feel uh, honored that uh, Ken would take the time to go through all those watercolors and and uh, pick out the ones that he felt was deserving of attention. One thing I I can add there is um, I was gratified that so many of the painters that Mark selected were actually past presidents of the National Watercolor Society or the California Watercolor Society, and in particular. Uh, I was glad you had Edward Reap in your collection because I really wanted to get him in there. And uh, cause he just, he died in 2015. And you look at his work from 1927, I don't think there was a year when he wasn't highly productive. And I was grateful that you had his work and you, you know, you've got the sheets and so many great painters. So it was an embarrassment of riches, Mark. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I will say too, Mark, when uh, Ken showed me some of the work from the collection, I was just um, blown away. I just really loved all the work. It was just a, you know, a feast for the eyes to see all the all those older paintings. They're just wonderful. So, well, thank you. That's very kind.
And then it's also great how well the current members of the National Watercolor Society stepped up and they're just every bit as good. And it really shows how uh, watercolor continues to evolve to the point where it's no longer called watercolor, it's called water media because there are so many new ways to approach it. Tremendous variety of, of work being done today. Yeah, I agree, Ken. The, the work by the National Watercolor Society is, is truly amazing. All the artist members, um, really amazing. So great work. So some of the members' works were stylistically similar to the early California painters, while others are pushing the boundaries and are quite progressive. So people are going to get a wide range of watercolors. Mark, I had a question as a collector. What things do you look for from artists in their information and their artwork? Well, thank you, thank you for asking. Um, needless to say, uh, what I decided to pick out uh, 30 years ago wasn't, uh, shall we say, uh, as sophisticated as perhaps uh, paintings that I'm, I'm picking out today, because your eye does evolve. Uh, one of the uh, one of the important things that I wanted to accomplish is I wanted to have a wide variety of different kind of paintings. So I really tried hard to to pick out a variety of subject matter, a variety of, of styles, uh, you know, so that when people come to our museum, they, they, they're presented with shows that are always interesting and always something different, a different viewpoint uh, for them to see. And uh, because there was such a, a large number of, of watercolors working in California uh, because of the studios, uh, you had thousands of artists that came from all over the world to do uh, uh, set design or paint backdrops or create animation or uh, illustrations for movies, you know, for movie posters. And so there was a, a, a huge preponderance of, of, of talented people here. So there was so many, there, there was over 500 uh, 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 artists in the uh, watercolor book that Gordon McClellan put together. And uh, so, you know, I, I, would just, I would just have to say, uh, because of the wide variety of artists and, and perspectives, it was uh, very lucky for me that I could at this moment recognize that there was a, 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 a you know, a uh, variety of things to pick from, and uh, which I did. Um, early on, it was very basic. It, you know, if I liked the scene, I would I would buy it. But then later on, I became more interested in um, composition. I, I wanted to look to, to see how they filled that space compositionally. Uh, in some cases, it was 16 by 20, a half sheet, or 22 by 30, a uh, full sheet. Uh, how did they fill that space up? Also, the subject matter. Uh, was the subject matter interesting, at least for myself and for my wife? Because uh, together, together, we, we would pick paintings. Um, and I also noticed, uh, Ken, as I was going through the uh, the show that th there was a preponderance of strong colors in all of the work that uh, uh, that that seemed to be a common denominator in the things that we buy. Uh, so I do I do appreciate strong color, um, and of course the spontaneity of watercolors. Uh, you know, many of these were done plein air, and uh, in order to be uh, spontaneous, have a lot of spontaneity. You had to have a lot of confidence in your ability as an artist to be able to do that, and you and that that uh, that comes right through the watercolor. You can just tell confidence in the strokes and and so forth, um, and of course the the capture of light. I think recently I've become more interested in paintings that have shadow and light that uh, that are used effectively. And, you know, I would say uh, probably 75% of our work is, is uh, figurative. Uh, 
and even figurative in landscapes. You know, you can have both. Uh, we don't have a necessarily have a lot of landscapes that are 100% uh, pure landscapes, maybe 10% in the collection. So I hope that answers the question. I might want to just quickly bring up one restriction we had, and that was in the specific mission statement of the Hilbert Museum is to only exhibit and highlight the works of artists who depict recognizable subject matter and themes. So that was a little difficult because uh, so many of the watercolorists in the National Watercolor Society do such fantastic non-objective works. So we were not able to pick any of those, but I think we still did a good idea getting very close with semi uh, representational, you know, getting very close to non-objective. So that was an interesting stipulation we had when uh, when we were jurying. Yeah, no, it is it is a very delicate balance, uh, and I do appreciate some uh, abstraction, some abstraction, but uh, you know, our goal uh, as a museum is to focus on paintings that are where you recognize what the subject is whether it's a landscape or a portrait uh, or a, a urban scene, uh, because uh, you know a wide variety of the paintings in our collection tell stories. And uh, telling a story is very much like what they did in the, mu in the uh, movie industry. You know, they wanted artists to come to work in, their, uh, in the studios if they had the ability to tell a story. And so, that's always been kind of a, a subtext uh, in our collecting, and certainly uh, it's part of our mission statement as a museum. There are a lot of museums that uh, focus most on uh, non-objective work, which is which is great. Uh, but I realized early on, as a, a smaller museum, that we couldn't we we couldn't serve two masters, and so I decided, well, we're going to pick. But we're going to pick representational uh, and focus on that and try to do the best job that we can. And I think if we do that, that uh, uh, success will come. It's a good explanation. Now everybody will understand why there are no non-objective works in the show. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that I'm, I'm glad that came up too as well, because that was one of the stipulations for the exhibition. So I'm glad you both talked about that. The last question is, is there a particular direction that you see the Hilbert Museum of California art taking in your art collecting and where you see the museum in 25 years? Well, absolutely. Uh, we are definitely moving strongly in the direction of, of uh, working with and displaying contemporary art. So uh, I would have to say that uh, 75 to 80 percent of the paintings that that I've purchased in the last year are paintings by contemporary artists. Um, 25 years that's that's a long that's a long uh, time frame. Uh, our our goal as a museum we opened up 40 years ago, uh, and before COVID we were running at a rate of about 30,000 visitors a year. Uh, and so we, we were right on target uh, for reaching 100,000 visitors a year in year 10. Uh, in a year from today, we're going to break ground on a, a significant expansion of the museum. So we'll, we'll increase our galleries uh, about two and a half times what we have right now. Uh, so that we'll have a lot more space to to show rotating shows. We'll be able to have uh, four, five, maybe six rotating shows going on, while at the same time have a significant amount of space for our uh, our permanent collection. Ken, I wondered if you, as a past president, you've been involved with the National Watercolor Society for quite a lot of years. If you can give us um, where you see the National Watercolor Society going in the next 25 years. Well, I, I have no idea other than to say that the National Watercolor Society 
is such a grassroots organization. It's, it's really artist driven. You know, all the volunteers need to be given a lot of credit for the, the work they put in because th they're often having to set their own brushes aside. So as long as we can keep up some sort of continuity and get enthusiastic uh, board members to continue to step up and keep the organization running and expanding, plus we have a, an actual gallery to run, I think that uh, the future is really bright. I don't know about 25 years. That's too far for me to speculate on, but kind of the same kind of question being a, a surfer for 55 years, I'm wondering in 25 years what surfing will look like. You know, it just gets so much better every year. And I'm wondering what art will look like. One thing I am sure of, if we keep going the way we are and continuing to grow uh, with the fine exhibitions the National Watercolor Society puts on, I think more and more people will be uh, constantly attracted to show through our organization. And really it's all about the artists. I mean, we are nothing more than the artists that join in to be part of our organization. So I have good feelings about it. And you certainly have done a great job stepping up as president and you have a wonderful board that you're working with. And I'm very optimistic. Well, thank you, Ken. I, I really like your analogy that, uh, you know, how much better surfing is going to be in 25 years. And I like that thought about artwork and galleries and um, artists. That's great. And, and on the behalf of the National Watercolor Society Board of Directors and members, um, I want to thank you both, Ken Goldman and Mark Hilbert, for answering our questions and giving us all your wisdom and um, and insights. So thank you very much for talking with us today and sharing with us. You're very thank you. welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's great. It's been my great pleasure talking with both of you today. Thank you. And now, if I could, I'd like you, Ken and Mark, to introduce the exhibition. Yes, we'd like to now introduce the virtual exhibition, National Watercolor Society, the first 100 years. With the Hilbert Museum of California Art.
I'm very excited to introduce Mary Platt, who's the director of the Hilbert Museum of California Art. And she is going to give us some of her favorite selections from this exhibition. Mary, we are really excited to hear what you chose. Well, thank you, Denise. We're very excited to have uh, a partnership with uh, the National Watercolor Society and especially on this occasion of your 100th anniversary, which is an amazing birthday. And of course, you know, we had hoped to have this exhibition up on our walls right now, but uh, with the current events going on with uh, the pandemic and everything, uh, it was just not to be this fall. Um, and of course, we're in the same boat as every other museum. Uh, but we hope to partner again with NWS in the future, um, hopefully in the near future. Um, and they have put together an amazing exhibition. Um, and I think that, you know, you owe it to yourself to really go online and, and um, go through all of these amazing paintings. Uh, so to make a quote, you know, director's choice uh, of about 10 of these great works was uh, almost an impossible task. They're all so wonderful. They range across such a great variety of styles. And they're really all masterworks. Um, so, but I had to choose. And so um, these are a few of my favorites. Uh, and, uh, and I'll just, um, I think what I'll do is go through the, the uh, paintings that come from actually the Hilbert collection first. These are paintings from Mark and Jan Hilbert's uh, wonderful California art collection uh, that they have built up over 20 years. And, um, these were selected uh, to be in this uh, in this amazing show. So um, I'll go through a, a few of those first. Um, the, my first choice was Rex Brandt's Surfs Up on a Golden Day. It's a painting that is from 1968. So this was a period when Rex was kind of into a little bit more of abstraction, but you can still see the figures in this, and it's surfers on the beach on a golden day in California. And interestingly, he used actual sea salt in the paint, you know, to sort of, I think, reinforce the theme of the painting. It gives a texture, but you can see that he built this composition out of a series of triangles. So the triangle is a very strong force in this work. And we love this work enough that in our opening year of the museum in 2016, we made it into a, a very popular poster that we gave out to a lot of our patrons. So we love Rex Brandt here and, and our collection includes many, many works by him. My second choice is Miller Sheets and it's a painting called Symphony Under the Stars, Hollywood Bowl. And of course, this is one of the icons of Southern California is the Hollywood Bowl. This is a painting that he did in 1956. And even though it's a late 50s painting, you can see that he's harking back to the Art Deco period of the 1930s. And you've got the searchlights going on. You've got these very strong curvilinears and, you know, this iconic sort of Art Deco monument itself taking center stage with all of its shell-like curves. And it's just a gorgeous painting. He actually did this at the behest of the Hollywood Bowl and they used it in some of their publicity for that year. My third choice is George Gibson and the work is called A Foggy Morning and it's from 1960. George Gibson was a scenic art director at MGM Studios. And of course, many, many of our great artists here on the walls at the Hilbert Museum either came to California or worked in the movie studios, you know, for the movie industry. So we can't emphasize enough the importance of the film industry in its influence on California art. And so, and you may look at this and think, well, what does this have to do with the movie industry? Well, he's painting this at a place called the Placeritos Ranch. And that was one of the great movie ranches that were around in the 50s and 60s that, you know, they kept the horses on and they actually filmed on these ranches. 
And the Placeritos Ranch was actually later uh, purchased by Gene Autry, and it became his Melody Ranch. So this is just a beautiful scene of very peaceful of horses and uh, that bulk of the trees springing up in the middle. It's kind of a daring composition, really. And and then the sensation of the fog as you move back into the piece and you get into the trees in the background, you really get that sensation that really only watercolor can bring you of that kind of spumato, we would call it in Italian art, of an actual weather of that time of day. So really masterful work by George Gibson. My next choice from the Hilbert collection is Lee Blair's Barnsdall Park. And that is a park in Los Angeles. And this is a deceptively simple watercolor. It's just, you know, you might look at it and think these are just some swatches of green paint. There's not a lot of detail to it. And that's the beauty of it. That's the genius of it. Lee Blair was another artist who worked in the movie industry. He was employed by the Walt Disney Studios for a long time. And you may know him as Mr. Mary Blair because he was married to the great Mary Blair of Disney fame. He was a fantastic artist in his own right. You can see it here. Again, very peaceful setting of this park. And then off to the left-hand side, you see a structure and that is actually uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Hollyhock House. And you can see just the edge of it there peeking out. So that becomes every all roads lead to the Hollyhock House in this uh, in this painting. So lovely painting by Lee Blair. And then my final painting that I chose from the Hilbert collection was Ralph Hewlett's Malibu Coastline. This shows again deceptively simple looking, but very hard to pull off. He's got these monumental rocks on each side, the coastline rocks down by Malibu, and then a few people walking among them. Beautiful color use. And Ralph Hewlett, again, was one of the movie artists, very famous. He worked for the Disney Studios for three decades, and his tenure with them stretched from actually the first full-length feature that Walt Disney did, which was Snow White, all the way to the very last full-length feature that Walt Disney was involved with, which was The Jungle Book in 1967. So the great Ralph Hewlett, we love him here and we have many, many of his works. So then moving on to the juried works that are in this National Watercolor Society 100th anniversary show. My first pick is Keiko Tanabe's New York City Lights, which is a 2020 watercolor. This is just so beautiful to me. Again, it's that sensation of mistiness and rainy. The streets are just rained on, and so you get the reflections, and it's that translucent quality that only watercolor can bring. You know, you've got the typical street traffic going on and the passersby, but you also have the kind of unlikely figure of the mounted policeman kind of looming up in the center of it, which brings your attention to that. My first thought when I saw this and the flags on the side was, you know, it might be a little salute to the flag paintings of Child Hassam, if you know those works, when he did those great pieces showing Fifth Avenue with the flags on the buildings. A beautiful piece. My next choice from the juried show is Matthew Bird's Plowman's Lunch. It's a piece from 2019. It's interesting because I'm teaching an art history class and we're just now getting into the 17th century Dutch masters. And this so much reminds me of some of the Dutch still lifes of the 17th century with the immense detail. And of course, those were meant to, I think, show the abundance and the wealth of the family that they were created for. This is, I think, Matthew Burr just showing his virtuosity at different textures and different colors. If you look at the, the realism of the foam coming out of the tankard, and you look at the immense realism of the different kinds of cheese. I mean, if you're a cheese expert, you could probably identify exactly what cheese is in this painting. Just beautiful. And, you know, of course, a plowman's lunch is just a simple lunch of cheese and fruit and probably some beer. So that's a beautiful work by Matthew Bird. My next choice is Diane Keemeyer's Takeout Time from 2015. 
again, I don't know, I must have been hungry when I was making these choices. She's showing the work backstage at a restaurant, which is always fascinating to me and probably, I think, to a lot of people, hence the number of backstage restaurant books that have come out recently. But the guys are at work, you know, preparing the food, and you're actually looking in, I think, through a window. You can see the reflections on the glass, but it's kind of work going on under glass here. And it shows, I think, the quiet dignity of these essential workers that we forget about sometimes when we're dining out, that these are the people that prepare our food when we're dining out. And of course, you know, recently they've been on the front lines. And so I really love this painting. You know, the beautiful sort of blues tending toward purples that she uses are just very attractive to me. So great, great job, uh, Diane Kemeyer. My next pick is William McKeon's The Ship's Doctor, a piece that he did in uh, 2010. This is just very dramatic to me. First of all, in awe of his technique and the super realism of this character, this older gentleman who's at work on one of the spars of a sailing ship. I'm a huge fan of the Patrick O'Brien sailing books. So when I saw Ship's Doctor, I immediately think of, you know, the ship's surgeon who's actually working on human beings, but this is a guy who's repairing the ship itself. So I think there's a little bit of a play on words there, but you know, he's an older gentleman and he's up there. I think he's splicing a rope. Again, it's an amazing arrangement of this kind of cross form that becomes the center part of the painting and is just silhouetted against a very pale sky. And you can really get a sense of the character of the person that is spotlighted here. So really great painting by Bill. And then my final piece that I chose was by Chris Krupinski. The name of the work is It's Friday Night. And it's a fun one. It's showing beer and popcorn, what we all dream of, I think, on a Friday night when we're getting home from work. Look again, this is so skilled. I mean, she does such a great job at capturing the various textures, ranging from the popcorn and the rough texture of that to the smoothness of the beer bottle and the moisture running down the sides and the, the foam on the glass of beer itself and just the way that she renders the glass. And then you get to the black and white checkered cloth underneath, which adds an entirely new aspect and other layer of texture and color to the entire thing. It's a, it's a really complex undertaking that she took on, and I think she really achieved it in a very masterful way. Congratulations, Chris. Uh, beautiful work. Uh, really, again, these were just a few choices from an incredible show. And I'm hoping that um, you can all come and see it online and go through all the paintings at your leisure and really pay attention to, I think, the, um, the compositions, the play of color, texture, and um, the, what watercolor can bring you. Um, Mark Hilbert and I were talking earlier today and saying that there is such a skill involved in watercolor. I mean, with oil paint, you can paint over things, but watercolor, you pretty much have to get it right the first time. And um, all these folks do. And it's, it's um, something I think that we can all see and appreciate and love. So thank you so much to the National Watercolor Society for bringing this together, for partnering with us at the Hilbert Museum. We look forward to many more years of partnership and uh, thank you, Denise, and thanks everyone at NWS. Thank you, Mary. I want to tell you that that was fascinating. I liked hearing about all the details on the Hilbert collection artwork, the history, all the design, and um, all the details you shared about the paintings. It was really interesting as well. Then the NWS paintings, your interpretation of each of those pieces. I've learned a lot and I know everyone listening will. Thank you very much for your insights and sharing them today. Thank you. My, my pleasure and honor to be here. Thanks, Mary, from Mary Platt, the director of the Hilbert Museum of California Art. Special thanks to past presidents, 
and jurors, Gerald Bromer and Ken Goldman, for their diligence and expertise in during this exhibition, and to the Hilbert Museum of California Art for collaborating with the National Watercolor Society to exhibit masterful paintings from their exceptional collection. Bravo to the Morris A. Hazen Family Foundation for supporting our centennial year celebration and to the all volunteer National Watercolor Society Board of Directors who put their brushes down to make our centennial year a success. This exhibition celebrates the excellence and inspiration of the last 100 years of the National Watercolor Society and provides a glimpse into our brilliant future.